great. Uh, our host, um, one of our hosts with Tom and as well, is, uh, is Lawrence Rosenberg. My pleasure to introduce Laurie that I've known for so many, many years. Um, he received his MD from McGill and then uh, was clever enough to do a, a, a master's in engineering management, which has stood him in very good stead, I think. Uh, as professor of surgery at McGill, he established uh, the multi-organ transplant uh, system. Uh, for the Montreal General and McGill, and then the pancreatic transplant program at McGill. Uh, this complemented his research interests in diabetes and, uh, and islet regeneration. And as Surgeon-in-Chief and then CEO at the Jewish General, he's actually made this hospital um, a center, a state-of-the-art uh, center for health care uh, across the board. He now, as he, he, he told you what he does now in this very long phenomenon, but he's putting his imprimatur on that as well. And this topic this morning is called The Idea Factory. Laurie, you're on. Thank you. I'm just <coughs> okay. Uh, good morning. And uh, first off, let me uh, welcome you all to uh, the Bureau General Hospital. Uh, one thing I probably should add that Thomas um, didn't is that part of the, the motivation for these workshops uh, uh, is grant funding from the CIHR. So uh, we should also thank our colleagues uh, in Ottawa. Yes. Uh, what I would, thought I would do uh, very briefly uh, this morning, since um, uh, I'm not a, um, a, a, a researcher in the field of, of innovation or technology, I'm more of a, a practitioner thereof or a victim thereof, uh, is just uh, relate uh, a number of vignettes uh, that to me um, speak to this, this concept of uh, where does innovation come from and um, sort of set the table, as it were, for, for the experts uh, who are here to enlighten us with respect to their research and their thinking. Uh, because this is the Jewish General Hospital, I thought I would begin with um, a, an historical Jewish reference, and, and Thomas actually spoke about the role of history, the importance of history. If one looks back in the innovation literature, um, you can look back 2,000 years, actually. Um, and I don't know how many people here have actually included a literature review of 2,000 years in their research. Um, but one can look back to exactly about 2,000 years ago uh, to the time uh, just around the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. So we're talking in the first century AD. Uh, there is a, a Jewish literature called the Talmud, which is uh, traditionally uh, called the, the Oral Law uh, in Judaism. And it isn't just a, a collection of laws, it's actually a history. Um, and so if you read a particular uh, portion of this book, and it's actually uh, 34 books, uh, you come to a story that's very interesting and actually speaks to this notion of centers and margins, although it doesn't call, call it centers and margins. So I'm going to read you in just four or five lines a summary of the story, and, and you'll start to get a sense of, of um, what this issue of centers and margins perhaps really is. So uh, there was a rabbi 2,000 years ago whose name some of you may have, have heard called Hillel. And so the story is this. Uh, we find that Rabbi Hillel gathered all his students together and said to them, my students, are you all here? Yes, they replied. But one of them said, everyone came except for the least of us. This is this introduction of the concept of centers and margins. Hillel said to them, bring that least one too, because in the future, he will be the leader of the generation. So they brought him, and his name was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who is a very important personality in uh, the Jewish religion and in Jewish history, because at the time that Rome was in the midst of destroying Jerusalem in AD 70, AD 69, 70, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai had himself smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin. 
he went to meet the Roman general Vespasian and he surrendered the city on condition that Vespasian give him the city of Yavne, which was just to the, the northeast of Jerusalem, and that generation of rabbis. And it was based on that discussion between him and Vespasian at that time that what we know today as rabbinic Judaism, Judaism today, was created. So this from an individual who was called the least of Hillel students. So that's the first vignette. Um, the second one, come forward about 2,000 years, which is a story that I think most people are familiar with, but it, it's worth repeating because I think we relive it almost every day. And it's a story about the Kodak moment. So many people hear the words Kodak moment and they think of a wonderful experience that you had years ago, um, either at Disney World or on your honeymoon or on whatever vacation. Uh, but other people think of the Kodak moment in a completely different sense. So such a Kodak moment occurred in 1975. Steve Sasson, a chief engineer at Kodak, invented the digital camera, 1975. It acquired an image and displayed it on an electronic screen. Yes, it was more cumbersome. It took longer and the resolution wasn't quite as good as a print you could get on paper but it was groundbreaking technology and a wonderful innovation. Subsequently, the reaction from the management was simple. It was filmless photography. So management responded, that's cute, but don't tell anyone about it. Let's just do our jobs. A true Kodak moment. Another Kodak moment occurred about 14 years later in 1989 when the CEO, Colby Chandler, retired. The board chose Kay Whitmore, who had been with Kodak for over 30 years. He represented the best experience that Kodak had and was very knowledgeable about the film business and was entrenched in the Kodak culture. Mr. Whitmore said that the public should not worry. He would make sure that Kodak stayed close to its core business in film and photographic chemicals. In January 2012, Kodak filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States, and that is after owning 80% of the film market in the world. So here again, we start to, to see this, I would call it a creative intellectual tension between what the center really represents, because when one thinks of Kodak as a corporation, it really was a corporate center of, of photography and, and technology, chemical technology. And so you can think about um, a reluctance to change, a, a failure to change, but perhaps it's just a, a lack of vision. The next vignette, a little bit shorter, comes from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, Toby Cosgrove, who some of you may know, um, is the former CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. He stepped down last month after a, a run of about 14, 15 years, a spectacular run at the Cleveland Clinic. And for those of you who visited the Cleveland Clinic, uh, their clinical program is divided into institutes. So they de-emphasize traditional departments, although they have them, but they have institutes. The largest institute, the most famous institute, is their cardiovascular institute, which has its own building, which is about the size of this entire hospital. If you go up to the operating room in the Cleveland Clinic Cardiac Institute, just at the entrance before you walk into the bank of OR theaters, there's this huge sign. Has anybody ever seen this sign? It's an amazing thing. I should have taken a picture, but I, I just didn't think of it. The sign says, through these doors go the world's greatest surgeons. Think about that, Harvey. We don't have a sign like that here. We're going to order one. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have one at the MUHC either. But that, that was the, the mindset of the Cleveland Clinic, which is really at the top of a healthcare pyramid in the United States and now around the world because they have centers in Abu Dhabi, they're in Toronto, they're building other places. However, with that, 
centerness, if I can use that word. Toby Cosgrove in 2005 was teaching a class of medical students. And the question came up of how good the care really was at the Cleveland Clinic. So this is a group of medical students talking to the CEO, who in his own right is a fairly famous cardiac surgeon. And one of the students, apparently, and I heard this from, from Toby when I was speaking with him a couple of years ago, apparently this medical student said to him, you know, Dr. Cosgrove, I wouldn't even send my dog to the Cleveland Clinic. And, you know, suddenly taken aback and said, why not? And she said, my aunt was here and she had the absolute worst patient experience that anybody could ever be subjected to. And it was from that time forward that Toby Cosgrove made it his personal mission at the Cleveland Clinic to institute their program of patient experience, which is now world famous. So the lesson that I learned from this is sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And it's more often true in a large center than it may be in a, a startup in the margin. The next vignette really comes from here. Um, so we're moving forward in time. And, and it really harkens back to um, an Apple advertisement that made the rounds when Steve Jobs came back to Apple in the, uh, the mid-1990s. And that was the, the commercial that started off by saying, here's to the crazy ones. Some of you may have seen that uh, ad. It's, it's a classic. It really is a classic. Um, and I, I want to make reference to that because uh, when I was chief of surgery here uh, several years ago, uh, we had an opportunity to design and build a new hospital, which is just on the other side of this building. And, you know, I, I thought at the time, uh, since we're going to build something new, uh, maybe it should be different from what we had previously and not just something bigger. Uh, so. As chief of surgery, I convinced the CEO at the time that maybe this might be a good idea, or a good time, to forcibly, forcibly merge cardiology and cardiac surgery together, since they both care for the same patients, and maybe at different ends of the care continuum, but they were the, sharing the same patient. The CEO agreed. At the time, he happened to be a surgeon as well. The people who didn't agree, you can imagine, were the chief of cardiology and the chief of cardiac surgery. Nonetheless, uh, I was given permission to design the new surgical unit in the new hospital, both the operating room and all the surgical nursing units, and I designed an integrated, consolidated cardiac program that brought cardiac surgery and cardiology together. At the time, the chief of cardiology thought that was one of the dumbest, wackiest ideas that anybody could ever come up with. And we didn't speak a lot over the last several years. However, in the last two years, when this integrated healthcare network was created by the government, I had another opportunity to put my two cents worth into the, the cardiac program. Because now, I wasn't just responsible for the hospital, I was responsible for the entire territory, almost half a million people, and a continuum of care that had to be pre-hospital, hospital, post-hospital. Post uh, together, Madame Dupuy and I have uh, seven, uh, no, five uh, rehab institutions, uh, seven long-term care facilities, home care services, walk-in clinics. So cardiac care really spans all of that, but it didn't two years ago. It was hospital focused. So I said to the chief of cardiology, um, who was still angry with me for forcing him into working with the cardiac surgeons in one footprint, I said, we're going to move to a Cleveland Clinic type of institute, but we're going to call it an integrated practice unit for cardiac care across the entire health network that we now run. And I'm offering you the opportunity to design and develop and implement this. Again, he thought this was the most crazy thing he had ever heard of. However, last week, which is now two years after the integration and about uh, five years after the hospital was designed, 
he made a presentation, actually he made a number of presentations to various governance bodies in this institution, extolling the virtues and the value of having been forced into this integrated, consolidated network. And he purposely said publicly that he thought I was totally crazy several years ago. And now even he has come around to seeing the wisdom of this sort of, of rethinking. So, I mean, to me the story is an interesting story because it, it, it points out one of the, the behaviors that one needs to have if one is going to be in the integration, in the innovation um, game, uh, which is grit. And, you know, grit can mean various things to various people, but to me it means uh, being persistent, having stamina, having passion for what you believe in, uh, and of course being resilient. And um, so I thought that was a good little story. Uh, the next little vignette that I'm winding down quickly here uh, has to do with Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison's teachers said he was too stupid to learn anything. Uh, that's a direct quote. Uh, so as an inventor, he made 1,000 unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. You all know that. When a reporter asked him, how did it feel to fail a thousand times? Edison replied, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention that took a thousand steps. It takes a very special mind, you know, to think like that. And again, at the time, Edison was in the margin. He certainly wasn't uh, at the center of the technological universe. So the message here is, and, and you all know this, is sometimes before you succeed, you have to fail. And if you don't fail, you may never succeed. The next little uh, vignette um, again touches me a little bit more personally and um, Phil, you touched on this a little bit earlier, has to do with Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, the philosopher, who said, all truth passes through three stages. Have you heard this before? Very interesting. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. All the time. <laughs> so uh, I actually <clears throat> live this uh, in my own research career. Um, uh, I, uh, in my PhD, made an observation that went totally contrary to the, the, the entire literature, even contrary to a seminal publication by a former um, McGill professor of anatomy who was the first one using a technology called autoradiography or radiotography to be able to identify and measure cell turnover in the body. And he had proven beyond a doubt that the cells that make insulin in the pancreas absolutely do not turn over. You're born with the number you have and you die with them. My research, unfortunately, demonstrated that you can regenerate insulin-producing cells. And I've spent the last 35 years working on that. And as Annie told you at the beginning when she introduced herself, uh, we do have a protein that's uh, sort of on again, off again in clinical trial, looking at whether or not we can capitalize on this, this observation. Which brings up another um, notion, um, something that Pasteur said, which I think is very pertinent. Chance favors the prepared mind. Um, the research that I was actually involved in at the time had nothing to do with insulin producing cells or diabetes, it had to do with cancer. And I was looking at developing an animal model for inducing the cells in the pancreatic ducts to turn over as a precursor model for developing cancer. And it just so happened that uh, I and my PhD supervisor identified in that model of duct obstruction that it wasn't only the duct cells that were regenerating, it was the pancreatic islet cells that were regenerating, and that led to the subsequent 30 or 35 year history of, of, of research. The next little vignette um, I mentioned to somebody earlier um, and really speaks to the, to the notion that uh, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, and again, this is more likely to be uh, in the margin than in the centers where you have an infinite amount of resources. Uh, I had an opportunity about a year ago to visit the largest HMO in Israel, which is called Klalit. 
Uh, Clalit is basically the same sort of health system that uh, Francine and I run here, but on steroids. Uh, we look after about 400,000 people. Clalit looks after 4 million people, 51% of the Israeli population. But the story is this. They were approached by Epic about uh, 12 or 15 years ago. Epic is the company that makes uh, probably the best electronic healthcare record in the world. Uh, any um, top tier medical center you go to anywhere, especially in the US, but really anywhere, uses Epic as its uh, consolidated uh, electronic health record. Epic approached Clalit about 15 years ago and asked them if they wanted <coughs> to buy uh, Epic to introduce into the HMO. And um, 15 years ago, Israel is not the country it is today. It was actually a very poor country. And um, Clalit couldn't afford to buy Epic, even though the asking price was only $15 million. Today, if Epic were to come here and ask me if I want to buy Epic, I'd probably have to come up with $500 million. So that, that's the difference we're talking about. But because Clalit needed an electronic healthcare record and they couldn't afford Epic, what did they do? They sort of borrow, begged, and stealed the information technology from the Israeli Defense Force and turned it into really a world-class electronic health record. And when I saw this demonstrated to me a year ago, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It's, it's light years beyond Epic. Uh, developed at virtually no cost because it was mainly in-house technology. And um, if I could institute their technology here, uh, I would buy it in a sec. Um, they wouldn't sell it to me for $15 million, and they probably wouldn't charge me $500 million. So somewhere in between, maybe we can have a, a discussion. Um, but again, that's the notion of you know, sometimes you're forced to do something that you wouldn't think you'd, you'd have to be able to do. Uh, which brings me to the issue of surgery, very briefly. Um, and Harvey uh, Sigmund actually is a fairly famous individual in his own right. Um, in the early 1990s, surgery was about to undergo probably the biggest change that it had in 100 years. And that was the widespread introduction of minimally invasive surgery. So the question is, where did minimally invasive surgery um, come from? And it came from various places, but the, 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 um, the Probably the, the, the one place that gets the, the credit for really making it go mainstream is a small community hospital in Tennessee. So it didn't come from a large university health center. It didn't come from the Mass General. It didn't come from Hopkins. It didn't come from uh, Berlin. It didn't come from Oxford or Cambridge. It came from a small community hospital in uh, Tennessee. And I mentioned Harvey because Harvey was one of the pioneers in Quebec, one of two or three, who at that time went off to learn minimally invasive surgery and introduce it here at the Jewish General. At the same time, Jerry Fried went off with uh, John Hinchy to Germany to, to learn it and bring it back to the Montreal General. It's an interesting story, not only because it really had its origins in a small community hospital, but there is a McGill component to this. At the time, and I won't mention any names, the McGill chairman of the Department of Surgery was vehemently against minimally invasive surgery and said so publicly. Uh, so much so that they invested at the other McGill hospital in buying a uh, lithotripter, a stone busting machine for $2 million because they thought that was going to be the future of treating gallstones, not minimally invasive surgery. So uh, at the time, there was this rivalry between the Montreal General Hospital and the Royal Victoria Hospital and this hospital, but more so between the Vic and the General. Uh, and the, the Vic always looked down on the General for whatever reason. And so you again, you get this concept of centers and margins, and it was really the margin that took the bull by the horns, had the vision, and moved forward with it. The last thing I just want to talk to very quickly and I'd be interested to hear what people have to say, is this notion introduced uh, over a decade ago by Clayton Christensen of disruptive innovation and how what he called disruptive innovation may or may not be different from other kinds of innovation. 
And the examples that he gives when you listen to him talk, and all of his lectures are on YouTube, and they're certainly worth listening to if you haven't heard them, uh, have to do with this notion of margins versus centers, because in his concept of disruptive innovation, all the disruption was brought about by the margins. It wasn't brought about by the centers. And he gives some very good examples. But the one in medicine, which he, he uh, speaks to frequently, is the introduction of angioplasty, cardiac angioplasty, and how it basically destroyed cardiac surgery <coughs> in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. And in fact, um, that is what happened. Um, there, there was a, a slow, bumpy development of angioplasty technology, first in peripheral vascular disease and then in uh, coronary uh, artery disease, uh, which has gotten so good uh, and has been extended so well that most of the aortic valves that are replaced today are replaced minimally invasively, non-invasively actually, uh, by TAVI and not by open surgery or even by robotic surgery. So it's, it's an amazing transformation just in the last 10 years. Um, and that does represent a, a disruptive technology and most of those have come from the margins. So the very last thing I want to say um, touches on healthcare in general. I lecture in the McGill Business School on uh, health systems. And it's something I enjoy doing, uh, not just because I enjoy doing it, but I enjoy seeing the reaction of the students to what I'm saying. And I was first asked to lecture in this particular course to talk about the role of hospitals in health systems. And I sort of evolved that talk to talk about health systems and not about hospitals. And it became clear after the first or second time I gave this talk that and this was to, to a graduate class, an MBA class, that uh, you could pick out the MBA students in the class who were from a health profession, nursing or pharmacy or the odd doctor, because those were the people twitching in the back row at the notion that maybe hospitals weren't that important, and which was basically what I was telling them. And now that uh, Francine and I have been in this, this new game of, of system development for the last three years, it's clear to me that, uh, in fact, hospitals uh, are not the center of the universe. Uh, they have specific roles to play, certainly uh, teaching, but not all teaching, because 85% of what patients need is out in the community. It's not in a hospital. Uh, research, very important role for academic health centers is, is fundamental research, but a lot of the patient-centered research is moving into the community for obvious reasons. So healthcare today um, is going through a very rapid transformation. And it isn't the issue there of centers versus margins, as it is uh, the issue of just general chaos at the moment. At least that's the perception by everybody in the system. And everybody likes to blame everybody else. So the most likely culprit that people point fingers at uh, is the government, uh, whether it's the ministry in this province or the ministry somewhere else. Uh, but it's interesting to listen to the people who work in these ministries tell you what their perception is. And their perception often is as valid as the perception of the providers of care in the system. But they're looking at opposite sides of the same coin. And they don't realize that very often. But I'm going to close by just telling you what I see happening today in healthcare, which will come back to the basic topic. Healthcare today has been completely disrupted by two things. One is by digitalization in its broadest sense. So everybody has one of these, whether it's uh, Apple or Samsung. There was a poll last week taken in the United States. 82% of American teenagers have an iPhone. And 84% want to buy an iPhone. <laughs> what does that mean? Those are the millennials, or the would-be millennials. Those are going to be the people who we're going to hire over the next five, six, seven, eight years. They're going to have certain expectations of how their work should be. And they're going to be the recipients of care. And they're going to have expectations about 
how and where their care should be provided to them. So digitalization is, is radically changing what we do. The second thing that's radically changing what we do is what I'd call the deciphering of the genome. Uh, we're moving rapidly into an area of precision medicine where we'll know specifically for many major diseases what's wrong and we'll come up with very specific treatments that'll be customized for individuals. We see it in cancer. We're going to see it in other diseases as well. Anything that has an autoimmune basis will probably fall in to the same category. So we're talking about the bulk of, of disease. That's going to tremendously change the game as well. And it's going to lead to something, two things actually. It's going to lead to what I call democratization of, of knowledge. Because things that doctors only could do years ago, and I mean specialists, and things that GPs are doing and we're doing the last several years can now be done by nurse practitioners, by pharmacists, by physiotherapists, by occupational therapists, by social workers, and by well-informed family members. This is driving doctors crazy, and I'm speaking as a doctor. The other thing uh, that's happening, though, as a result of all of this, is disintermediation. And disintermediation is, is related to this democratization of knowledge because it's removing doctors from the equation. Now, there's going to be the, the odd person here who's going to say, well, you're always going to need a doctor, and I would agree. The question is, what is that doctor going to do? Where is he or she going to be, and how are they going to be remunerated? Because as part of this whole transformation, and because of the, the uh, introduction of, of precision medicine and widespread um, sharing of knowledge, it's becoming uh, clear that the healthcare game is wide open now. And there are three groups of providers that are rapidly coming into healthcare. And this is where this issue of centers and margins comes back, because these all represent centers, different centers. So you have a group of corporate entities that are called um, lean added, uh, lean value added providers. Okay? These are some of the large pharmaceutical companies like Novartis, like Roche, who want to do more than just sell drugs. They want to sell support, a facilitating network or something to support their pharmaceutical uh, pipeline. You have a group of, of, of corporate providers, other centers, that are called value-added providers. These are primarily device companies. So Medtronic is probably the best known. They don't want to be device companies anymore. They want to be service providers. So I was at the head office of Medtronic two weeks ago in Minneapolis talking about value-based healthcare, which I'll close with in a moment. I walked out of the conference room on the way to the washroom, and I walked into this huge room, I mean huge, huge room that looked like a large parking lot. And it was divided into modules, and at every module there was a computer and an individual sitting with a headset and a telephone. And I asked the person that was escorting me to the bathroom, I said, what is this? And they said, it's our call center. And I said, but you're a device company. Why do you need a call center? And they said, you don't understand. We're not a device company. We're a service provider. These are all nurse practitioners. They had more nurse practitioners in that one room than we have in all of Quebec. And they were managing patients at home and there were zero doctor involvement. And Medtronic, a few weeks ago, just won the VA contract in the United States to manage six million veterans remotely. This is where healthcare is going. Then there's a last group of corporate centrists, if you will, that are called the digitals. And the digitals are three different groups of, of companies. There's the so-called uh, digital uh, healthcare to digital, there's the digital to healthcare, and there's the new digitals. So an example of the uh, digitals to healthcare 
would be companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, who are very rapidly getting into healthcare. Very rapidly. In fact, Apple we know, and it may be true of Amazon, actually we know it's true of Amazon, because Amazon several weeks ago uh, was in a story in the Wall Street Journal that uh, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan together are forming a healthcare entity in the US to provide healthcare to employees. More recently, the story has leaked, and I know this to be true, Apple is starting to buy up healthcare clinics. All right? So those are the, the digitals to healthcare. There's the healthcare to, to digitals, um, which are companies that are traditionally in healthcare, uh, but are moving more into a digital frame of mind. And IBM with Watson would fall into that uh, kind of category. And then there's a very interesting category, which comes back to the margins. And that's the category of new digitals. There's a company that I know of, uh, a privately held company, that has a plan to introduce a network of private primary care clinics throughout Ontario over the next three years. All right? Perfectly legal within the Canadian healthcare system. Uh, they've already uh, uh, signed agreements with three health hospital systems in the greater Toronto area. And the deal there is to co-partner, co-manage these primary care clinics between the health system, the hospital system, and this private company, which lets the government off the hook because the government doesn't have to pay for what goes on in this private area. Patients don't have to pay because their doctors bill OHIP. There is a way that this company is going to make money, which is fascinating, which can be a whole other discussion. All this to say, uh, this is the current landscape in healthcare uh, in North America. I don't know what it is. Uh, in Europe, um, but I thought it was interesting just to sort of take this journey with you over the last 2,000 years and, and point out certain things, because I think we're in the midst of a, a generational opportunity, uh, both in terms of, of people who run health systems and how we can reconfigure the health system to provide much better service to the population. Uh, generation, generational opportunity for people coming into the workforce because we're going to have a huge turnover in this province of middle and senior managers over the next 18 months. Huge. It's projected to be as much as 45% turnover. So there's going to be an opportunity for people in the private sector, people coming out of school to come into healthcare and help transform healthcare because these are all the millennials and the post millennials. So I think I'll stop there. I think I've probably said more than enough. Um, and hopefully uh, giving you some food for thought. We are now open for discussion. Questions and comments? All right. I just want to round up the story on the beginnings of the days of surgery in this hospital. When I came back from San Antonio in 1990, there were about 100, maybe less, laparoscopic gallbladder removals done in all of North America and I came to the CEO of the time and I said I think we should be getting into this. He said what is it going to cost? I said for a complete set to go ahead and operate it would cost $60,000. He said $60,000. He said there are a lot of people here who would like to get $60,000. Why should I give it to you? How do we know that this stuff is not going to sit in a closet in about six months? I said we don't know that. I said but you have to make a decision. Do you want to be in the vanguard or do you want to be on the tail? So he said, well, you find somebody who will contribute half of that, and I'll give you the other half. And that's how we started. And the other thing that you should know is that also in the Talmud 2,000 years ago, it says the most important thing in your self-development is to get yourself a good teacher. And Laurie sort of epitomizes that, as you can all see. And I should put out publicly thank Harvey for actually helping me do the first uh, Cardiac <laughs> defibrillation. Cardi first, alternating currents. The first, <laughs> the first closed cardiac massage. With alternating current. With alternating current. <laughs> yes. Anyway, all that Hop said. Hopkins had developed it and he was the first one to do it. <laughs> God help us. Okay. Um, it, it's interesting in, in what you comment uh, early on in terms of m making crazy decisions. Uh, if we assume that good science starts with people that are fairly young, <coughs> oftentimes we need to have someone who will allow us 
And I often feel very guilty when people say, you developed this thing. I was in my first year of residency when I got this sort of mad idea. And my then mentor, my then tormentor, was happily going back to England. And I went to see Sam Friedman, who was then the chair of, uh, of allergy, and pitched this idea to him. And he said, what's to lose? Without that, it would never have happened. So I think it's important to have people not only who have crazy ideas, but those who might buy into them. And I think we've all met people who will, and as you point out, people who won't. Other, yes, Tom. What struck me in all of the vignettes is, as a common theme, is the unpredictability. So there is no point when you can really say that something will work out or not. It's crazy ideas, it's something unusual, it's marginal, which, uh, when you think ahead, uh, a step further ahead, also means that you cannot plan innovation. What do you think about that? It's interesting, because I, I, I had a, a third page here with one line on it. Um, and it, it says, what's the role of government in innovation? And, and I have one word here asking whether or not having government and innovation in the same sentence is an oxymoron. Um, because governments believe that they drive innovation. Um, and, and they may in part because they hold the purse strings. But for them to think that they drive innovation, to me, is just a, a totally crazy notion, and I'd be glad no. to hear what other people have to say, because uh, when you think of maybe the most important, one of the most important government-driven projects ever, it was the rapid development and deployment of the atom bomb at the end of World War II, which you could argue was a government-driven project, but it wasn't a government-run project. I mean, they brought in uh, the best physicists in the world, literally, to do something which was, was rather remarkable at the time. So y you could say, okay, government had some foresight. I wouldn't call it foresight. I would call it maybe paranoia. Uh, uh, but as you were saying, they, they did release the money to do something which had to be done, but it, it wasn't sort of driven by government. Um, if you think of other large government projects, I mean, most of them have ended in terrible budget overruns, <coughs> in time overruns, in, with, with terrible unforeseen consequences. Uh, and we have several in this province that we can speak to, the Olympic Stadium being one. Uh, you know, a, a bridge that's falling down is another. Uh, so I, that was the last thing I was going to comment on. Does government have a role to play in, in innovation? Yes, please. You rather a comment and an observation than a question, but maybe it ends with a question. Um, looking at the vignettes you gave, a common tapas is that, although you didn't mention it, there is a fear of deprofessionalization in the medical profession. Whenever an innovation is there, be it uh, uh, minimal surgery or digitalization or even the employment of the stethoscope 200 years ago, there is this fear of deprofessionalizations that other people might take over the central role physicians are playing in the game of centers and margins in medicine. And what, from my perspective, is really disruptive in the digital process combined with artificial intelligence is that this deprofessionalization seems to be different from the fears before. Um, because in former examples like minimal invasive surgery, maybe just the discipline changed, but it stayed within the medical profession who is doing that. Not only the surgeons, but people from internal medicine could do it. Uh, and now the digitalization, at least from my perspective, leads to a new stage. Um, either the whole image of the professionalized physician has to change, not being a psychologist, surgeon, or anything anymore, but, but somebody who knows how to work with a computer, 
or the medical profession as a profession should obstruct digitalization on all ends, which is not an option, I think. So, and, and here's the question, how do you think a medical profession could cope with the brave new world of digitalization and non-professionals being able to give via the internet as good as advice as a land So, so the answer is, unfortunately, the medical profession is not coping well <laughs> with exactly what you describe, and it's what I call disintermediation. It's removing physicians from the equation. And um, Quebec, uh, unfortunately, uh, will be the last bastion of free enterprise medicine in North America. Uh, it already is probably the last bastion of free enterprise medicine in Canada, and the proof is the government several months ago brought in a piece of legislation called Bill 130, which was the first attempt at trying to rein in the practice of physicians, not in an unusual or, uh, or, uh, or a, a abusive sort of way, but just to start building some parameters around what practice should look like. And the physician unions in this province just threw a complete fit, went public, the, the premier of the province, the prime minister of the province, had to pull the health minister off the dossier because they're in a pre-election period. It was becoming too politically sensitive. They shelved the bill, um, which was the worst thing they could have done because that would have been the first time ever in this province that people who run health organizations would have had some leverage over how physicians can practice in the institution because these are all public institutions, but physicians in Canada are all private entrepreneurs. They're not employees. So how do you run a company where the primary cost driver is not accountable mm -hmm. to generating the cost or not accountable to the quality of the service provided? But that's the Canadian reality. It's very difficult. And you're right, AI is going to totally disrupt certain medical specialties. It already is in pathology. And the next one is radiology. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and somebody made a public comment that said, you know, somebody should start telling the deans of the world that perhaps they should stop training radiologists. Um, and that wasn't such a crazy mm -hmm. comment. Because AI, as you know, is developing very, very quickly. Yeah. I, I think the other, if this is another Schopenhauer, when it finally happens, all the doctors will say, we knew it all the time, and we were pushing it from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I just want to add some sort of a European perspective. <coughs> You're very skeptical about innovations in by the state. On the other hand, I think from a European perspective, or from European perspective 150 years ago, so think about Robert Koch or Paul Ehrlich, they were both working in state institutions. And I think it's a question of size. And I think this is also some sort of an Anglo-American perspective. The interesting thing is around 1900, when you have American and you have a British research institution, like the London School of Tropical Medicine, they were very jealous looking on the Berlin Institute I think they have all the money, the security, can, they can do what they want, they don't have to ask for money every, <coughs> every week and, or doing all the reports. And on the other side, the Berlin scientists were all the way complaining about writing reports, doing all this advisory counseling to the, and so it was always this different perspective and everybody was jealous on everybody because they all thought they have the money, they have the freedom. But I think it's probably not that the state is such is not, yeah, has not the possibility to, to uh, push innovations or something like that. I think it's a question of, of the setting of the institutions and probably also of the size of institutions. Saying this, thinking about the Berlin airport and the disaster about this, this is probably also some sort of a, making this a relative sense of what I just said, but um, I think it's not impossible. It's just a question of the setting and if you have a ministerial director like Althoff, 150 or 130 years ago, then that might be a very great setting for researchers doing, thinking about whatever they want. And 
yeah, it's just some sort of a. Uh, yeah. So, so um, um, I want to build on this point to 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 as to to talk a bit about the role of government. Um, it's very hard, and especially in this province, not to think of the government as a behemoth, as a stodgy, unchanging, uncaring, uh, run by bureaucrats, um, worried about elections and so on. And so change is, is hard. But if you look, uh, but, but talking about government as government is a bit too high level uh, a level, because there, there really are parts of the government and different uh, power centers in the government. A minister of finance does not want to see the cost of health care rise above a certain portion of the budget, and a mis minister of health has to do something about it. And out of that, innovation is born. And if you look at, and again, I hesitate to give the example because uh, the minister <coughs> of health is a controversial figure, but he is an innovator. At least he's trying to change things, he's doing things. Uh, he's forcing change is very painful for the medical profession and for uh, many sectors uh, but I think uh, out of necessity the g one branch of the government is pushing for innovation and change and modernization other branches of the government probably are not and are, are reflecting uh, kind of the, the, the same old same old so I think one has to be a bit more precise when we talk about the government right yeah, I, I would agree with you. And I think what uh, Minister Barrett is doing and is trying to do um, is very uh, laudatory. Um, and I agree with all of it. Um, in fact, I was the first CEO in the province to come out publicly to support Bill 10, which is the law that they brought in uh, three and a half years ago to create these new health systems. Because, you know, I, I said to myself, it's about time. Um, and, and he's doing it from the, the point of view of a physician, because he is a physician. Um, and, and he's a smart guy. And I guess the controversy revolves around uh, the how, uh, not so much the what, um, and the funding of it. And, uh, but I, I would agree. Uh, it, it was a very daring uh, move on, on his part. Perhaps the last comment for this session we'll talk about later. Yes, please, go ahead. I have a comment about the notion of margins and centers. When you recounted the Cleveland example, <coughs> this notion perhaps is effective when we would like to set fixed perimeters. However, where is the patient in this dichotomy? <coughs> Does the patient have, have a role in innovation? I think perhaps the innovation, rather than being understood as technical, could also be in trained as an intellectual innovation and try to reshape the position of a patient. So my question is, in the Cleveland example, was the patient experience considered on the margin? And my second question is, according to your experience, what is the role of a patient within this big perimeter that we call innovation? Well, with respect to the Cleveland Clinic at the time, going back to 2005, the patient was at the margin. I mean, they knew they were delivering good care in terms of an outcome, but they really weren't worrying about the experience of the patient until it was made very transparent. They now have probably, uh, arguably, the best patient experience program in the world uh, with patients at the center. And in fact, if you go to the Cleveland Clinic, everybody wears a button that says patients first. Everybody, from the CEO down. So they really uh, live, they walk the walk, they walk the talk, if you will, 
they, they live it now. It wasn't true 10 years ago or 12 years ago. But the role of the patient is in healthcare is pivotal. They should be at the center of everything. And, and, and don't forget, we're all patients, or potential patients. Um, and when people come to me, my managers come to me, and ask me what they should do about this, that, or the other thing, I have one answer, and Francine knows this. I say, do what's best for the patient in the circumstance that you're in. That's, that's the answer. And you know, sometimes it, it may go against somebody's policy or whatever, but that's the answer. If you're doing the best you can for the patient, you can't be faulted. I've often thought that there should be a department, an aftercare department in medicine because people cured and left to suffer whatever other consequences came from the treatment, and doctors don't really think about that so much, at least not in the United States. Um, um, what you're talking about is, is actually interesting to me, what they're doing there. I don't think it's happening in New York City hospitals as well. As I don't think so. To bring the discussion full circle, when you mentioned Hillel uh, and the example, it's interesting how things get marginalized even there. There were two rabbis at the time. There was Hillel and Shammai. And they both had contravening, or they had contrary arguments all the time. Hillel always wins. <laughs> so Shammai has been marginalized. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Thank you very much. Yeah.